Um, so I'll start out with what's to some extent a joke. Uh, sorry. It's yeah, just use arrows. Sorry? Just arrows. Yeah, I'm using arrows. Oh, okay. Um, so what's life? Self-replicating information. But information about what? How to self-replicate. So, of course, that's not meant to be a complete definition of life, and I have no desire to try to find a complete definition of life. But it shows that there's uh, an interesting relationship between information and self-replication, which is close to the heart of the puzzle of what is life or what is biology. Um, so although this is the, uh, an institute for complexity, since I'm a mathematician, I really like simplicity rather than complexity. I would like to start some uh, institute of simplicity sometime. Uh, but, and, and so because, uh, because that's the way I am, I'd like to uh, think about this question, but focusing on some very simple aspects, uh, not, not the glorious complexity. So, so one thing that turns out to be very important to make progress on this question of how self-replication and information are related is the concept of relative information. So if you ask yourself, how much information do you get when you learn something, then a very important remark is that it depends on what you already knew or on what you already believed. If I tell you something you already knew, in some sense, you, you learn nothing, except perhaps that I believe it. Um, I'm going to take a subjective Bayesian approach here, so I, I don't really care so much about what's true or what's not. So I'll alternatively use terms like believe or know, or I can, may use the term learn, but that doesn't mean that what you're learning is, is true. Uh, so we can model hypotheses about a situation as probability distribution, say to keep it simple on some finite set. So if you have a hypothesis about what's going on, it's a probability distribution P on that finite set. And when you learn something or change your mind about something, you update your prior hypothesis to a new one, a new probability distribution I'll call Q. And so the question here is, how much information do you gain in that change of, uh, of hypotheses? And there's one fairly standard answer to that question, uh, which, is, which I'll call the information of Q relative to P. And it looks sort of like the formula for Shannon entropy, if you're familiar with that. Uh, but it involves both these probability distributions. So QI over PI is telling you basically how surprising it is to find out that something event had probability QI when you thought it had probability PI. So if it's, for example, uh, you know, 10 times more likely to happen than you expected, that will be 10. We convert this. Uh, take a logarithm to make, make things add rather than multiply, and then uh, compute the expected value of that with respect to the new probability distribution QI. So sometimes this could be called the expected amount of surprise. And although the term expected surprise sounds uh, oxymoronic, uh, this quantity here is, it would be called the, 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 the surprise or surprisal, uh, and you're taking the expected value of that. Um, I like to call this thing the information of Q relative to P. In the technical literature, it's been burdened with what this name that I hate, uh, Kullbach-Leibler divergence. Not because I dislike Kullbach and Leibler for, for, for di inventing this wonderful idea, but I don't think such a, a fundamental concept should be saddled with such a long-winded and uh, uninformative uh, name. I think this is a truly fundamental concept. It's, uh, it's the concept of information, but made relative to take into account the fact that how much information is in the probability distribution Q depends on what you thought was happening, which was P. Uh, it has some properties that you'd want, that it's always greater than or equal to zero, and it's equal to zero if and only if the probability distributions are the same. So only if they're the same do you not learn anything. So if you haven't thought about this, it's good to see just a couple of examples. So suppose you flip a coin and you th think it's fair. So your prior hy hypothesis is that the heads and tails both have probability one half. Uh, then so you learn 
that it lands heads up. Now you know that the probability of it being up is one. Uh, and so you can work out the information you've gained uh, by looking at the coin, which is I of Q relative to P. And if you work it out, you get the logarithm of two. So that means that you've gained one bit of information. That's supposed to make be seem almost too obvious that, the, that, when you, that when you see which way a coin lands, heads are up, you've gained one bit of information. But you've gained one bit of information given that your assumption ahead of time was that the probability of it landing heads or tails up were equal. But suppose you had a different prior. Suppose you thought for some reason, like you looked at the coin and you saw that one side was made of a different metal than the other, that there's only a 25% chance of it landing heads up. Then, when you learn that it lands heads up, you get a different answer for this relative information. And I picked an example where the calculation comes out to give you something very simple. Now you get two times log two, so you've gained two bits of information. In other words, an event that had probability one quarter, according to your prior assumption, has occurred uh, so instead of one half, and so you get twice as much information. So how much you learn from a given event depends on what you thought was going to happen. Now this concept of relative information, because it's so fundamental, it shows up all over the place, and I just sort of want to tell you a little bit about where it shows up, leading up to some idea, places where it shows up in biology. But of course, biology is largely based on, on chemistry and thermodynamics, uh, so you'd expect that if relative information was so important, it would already show up at those levels, and indeed it does. So there's a concept that we learn about in thermodynamics called free energy. So the free energy of a system is basically the amount of energy that's in the useful forms rather than waste heat. And what it is, is it's the expected value of the energy of the system minus the temperature times the entropy. So it's how much sort of extra energy it has that's not in the form of heat. Very roughly, you can speak of this as being the energy, energy in the form of unusable heat. And in <coughs> thermal equilibrium, this free energy is minimized, and basically reactions tend to move in the direction of reducing the free energy. And so if you take chemistry classes, you, you do lots of calculations of free energies to see what's going to happen in various situations, knowing that this is the case, that the directions are going to be moving you towards reducing free energy. But the interesting thing is that free energy is actually relative information in disguise. So what is this free energy a little bit more precisely? So suppose you have a system that can be in lots of states, some finite collection of states. And suppose that the probability of it being in the ith state is some number qi, then its free energy is this. So it's the expect each state has some energy ei, let's assume. So the expected value of the energy is qi times ei summed up over all states. The entropy, uh, well, if you're just a mathematician, the entropy is minus QI log QI. That's the Shannon information or the, or the entropy of the probability distribution QI. But if you're a thermodynamicist, you want to uh, put, some, put some units in there. And you'd, so you'd multiply that by Boltzmann's constant. Um, and then to, uh, so the temperature times the entropy would be this KT times that sum there. So that's what the free energy that I talked about in the first slide, what it really is. It's a thing that you can calculate if you know the energy of each state of your system, if you know the probability of the system being in any one of those states, and you know the temperature. That's what it, that's what it really is. Um, so equilibrium, thermal equilibrium, you can think of as a specific hypothesis about the system state. In other words, a specific probability distribution on those states. And in this probability distribution, the probability of being in the ith state is e, it's proportional to e to the minus Boltzmann constant times the energy divided by t. This is called the Boltzmann distribution. There are ways to figure out why this is a, such a good hypothesis. I don't want to 
distract ourselves with that right now, but the main thing to realize is that system is in a very high energy state. Uh, with, with the higher the energy, the less probability a state is, and how fast the, pro that distribution, that probability drops off depends on the temperature. So when it's very cold, you're very unlikely to be in a high energy state. When it's warm, uh, T is small, so this, this, when, it's, when it's warm, T is big, so this one over T is small, so this drops off more slowly. So that's equilibrium. Uh, so you can work out what happens if you compare the free energy in equilibrium to the free energy in any other probability distribution. And it's just a nice little algebra calculation. I've given you all the formulas you need to, to do this calculation. It's just ma manipulations with algebra uh, to work it out. Um, and, it, and the answer is beautiful. It says that the difference in free energy between the free energy of this other probability distribution, Q, and the equilibrium is just KT times the relative information. So if you don't worry so much about the KT factor, which is, of course, important, you could say that basically uh, relative, that the free energy of a system minus the free energy in equilibrium is the information that you have about the system relative to equilibrium. So in other words, you should think of the equilibrium probability distribution of, for example, the states of the atoms in a glass of, of uh, water as being a kind of hypothesis, a default hypothesis about what the water will be doing. And if you look at the water and you say, my god, they're like a, there's like a, a big, uh, like if it's like jumping out of the glass or something, or there's like a wave in the water, it's, it's not conforming to that equilibrium distribution. Uh, and so what, there's some, it takes extra information to describe it relative to the equilibrium state. And that's exactly equal to how much free energy it has minus the free energy of the equilibrium state. Yes? Is that true for any P or only equilibrium P? That's only true for the equilibrium P. Yeah, so the, yeah, that's right. So you have to use that formula for, for P to get this to work out. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so since the relative information is bigger than or equal to zero, and it's zero only if Q equals P, then that's the, that's, that's the same, that's also true of this difference in, in free energies. So what we see from that is that free energy is minimized in equilibrium and only in equilibrium. So the approach to equilibrium in, a, in thermodynamics is the same as the system losing, get, getting less and less uh, information in it relative to the equilibrium state. In other words, it, it's, it's becoming less and less surprising that the system is in that state. And indeed, there are lots of theorems that, ex, that say that free energy tends to decrease. So for example, if both uh, if you have any two probability distributions, P of T and Q of T, that are changing with time, and if they're evolving via a Markov process, meaning that they obey some linear equation uh, that, that preserves the fact that they're probability distributions, so any linear equation that preserves probability distributions is called a Markov process. Whenever that happens, you, if you work out the relative uh, information of Q of T relative to P of T, that will, that can never increase. So, so the time derivative is always less than or equal to zero. So in particular, if uh, P is an equilibrium distribution, so it's not changing with time at all, then, that, then that's just staying the same. And this quantity here is basically this difference in free energies. And so this is saying that in this, under these assumptions, free energy will decrease with time. So, so the decrease of free energy is basically the decrease of relative information. And, and I'm saying that that's the kind of dynamics of, that information likes to engage in. Uh, now, this is one kind of assumption about what's going on with these probability distributions, that they're evolving via a linear equation. But there are other kinds of uh, 
situations where probability distributions evolve in different ways. And I'll talk about one now that shows up in evolutionary game theory. So, sorry. So, suppose you have a bunch of self replicating entities of different kinds. And I'm a mathematician, so I should have probably stopped this slide there. That's all I wanted to say, okay? But when mathematicians try to talk to normal people, they've discovered that examples are occasionally requested. So, it could, I, could, I could mean molecules of different chemicals. I could mean organisms belonging to different species. I could mean genes of different kinds. I could mean restaurants belonging to different restaurant chains, people with different beliefs, people playing games with different strategies. You can maybe imagine some games where, where players get killed off if they don't do well enough or change their strategies if they don't do well enough. So, so these are the type of things that uh, I have in mind here. But since I can't, since I need to say something, I'll call them organisms of different species, just, just for short. Um, so there's a f famous equation uh, that's very general that describes how their populations might change with time. So let capital PI be the population of the i species as a function of time. And we're going to treat it as continuously variable. So we're going to assume there's so many Starbucks that you might as well treat it as a continuum of them. And you can differentiate the number of Starbucks as a function of time. Right? Uh, and and so one popular model for how these populations change in time is to say that the population of the i species uh, changes in time at a rate proportional to how many, to the population itself, times a fitness. But we don't demand that the fitness just be a constant. Then we just get exponential growth or exponential decay. We, we assume that the, pop, the fitness could be a function an arbitrary smooth function of all the different populations. So this is actually an extremely general equation. It's basically almost just any old first order differential equation because f of i can be anything. The only thing we're saying really here is that as the population goes to zero, this right hand side had better go to zero. Well, if you're a mathematician, you know I'm lying slightly, but it's basically that, that it's saying that you know you, you can't get enough, something from nothing in this equation. If a population starts out being zero, it will never spring into existence uh, if this equation holds. Um, so now we can bring probability theory into the game by thinking about the probability that a randomly chosen organism belongs to the ith species, where you just so you just line up all the organisms in a line and randomly pick a number from 1 to n and, and, and see what's the probability that, that that organism is an i species. So it's just the population of the i species divided by the total population. And you can work out the, just from this uh, first equation, you can work out the time derivative of the probabilities. That's a calculus exercise, but the answer is, is very nice. It says that what, what the answer is, is that the probabilities change at a rate proportional to the probabilities, but now times something new, now times the fitness of the i species minus the mean fitness, the average fitness, where you weight where you, uh, of, of all your organisms. And that has a nice uh, interpretation. It has a number of nice interpretations. I mean, the first thing to realize is that is what this means is that the, the, f the probability of something being the i species will grow if the fitness of the i species is greater than the mean fitness. So in other words, your market share will spread as long as you're better than average. So you don't need to be good to, 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 to have your, the fraction of people like you uh, increase. You just need to be better at reproducing than, than average, which explains lots of things, right? Um, but, but you can think of this also in terms of learning uh, or hypotheses, because I've said before that we can think of probability distributions as describing a hypothesis about, ab about which of several uh, situations is the case. Here we can think of PI as a hypothesis 
about what's the best organism to be. It's a funny way to think about it. But you can think of each species as a strategy for survival, a way for an entity continue to survive. And you can think of, uh, then, of PI, the probability distribution P as being a hypothesis about what's the, the best uh, way to survive. And we see here by this equation that PI will grow if the fitness of the i uh, organism is greater than average. And, and so that the, 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 uh, your hypothesis will be refined over time as the most fit organisms tend to increase. The probability of being one of the fit ones tends to increase. So this is nicely explained in a paper by Mark Harper, who's right there. Uh, and you can see that this is actually a continuous time version of Bayesian hypothesis updating, where you, you have, a, have a probabilistic hypothesis and you keep updating it uh, with, with, as, you, as, you make, as, you, um, as you learn new, new things. Here, here it's happening over time in a continuous way. So now, bringing relative information into the game, suppose that Q is some fixed probability distribution of species. So it's just arbitrary thing that's fixed, while P is changing following this equation that I wrote down, basically following the replicator equation. Then you can just do some calculus and you can work out the time derivative of the information of Q relative to P of T. And there's a nice formula for it. It's minus this uh, same quantity we've seen before, the fitness of the i species minus the mean fitness, uh, averaged over all the uh, different species, weighted by the probabilities qi. So I I'd like to understand what this equation really means and tell you what it really means. So I'll repeat it up here. So what's going on here is that you can think of i of q relative to p of t. That would be the information you would learn if you started out with the hypothesis p of t and then updated your beliefs and wound up at q. So p of t, this hypothesis, or probability distribution of organisms, is changing with time. And we're th saying how much you'd learn if it w you went from that to this fixed probability distribution, Q. And what we're saying is the time derivative of that information less to learn is minus the average excess fitness. By excess fitness, I mean, so here we look at the fitness of the ith organism minus the mean fitness. So it's how much more fit it is. But we're averaging it with respect to this probability distribution, probability distribution qi. So one nice way to think about it is you can imagine you have this big probability distribution of species uh, distributed according to the probability dis distribution p of t. And then you drop in a small sort of droplet of invaders, some other pop population distribution that's distributed along the distribution Q. If you think about it that way, that's a good way to think about it. It's, then this is the average excess fitter the invaders are. So of course, if the invaders are fitter, they will, they will sort of tend to take over. And what we're saying here is that how much fitter the invaders are is this right-hand side without the minus sign. Now, if that average excess fitness is greater than or equal to 0, no matter what the time-dependent population distribution is, then we call Q a dominant distribution. I call Q a dominant distribution. Other people call it other things, but I don't like those things. Um, so this is the royal we speaking here. But, uh, there, it's sometimes called an evolutionary stable strategy, but, but there's several different meanings of that term. And this isn't really about stability. It's really about dominance, being better on average than any other population you encounter. 
Yeah. Um, well, P of T is like the real thing. P of T is like the population that's evolving in time. I'm about to consider the possibility that Q is the best possible, uh, the, the, is the equilibrium distribution. And so in that situation, you should imagine P of T is getting closer and closer to Q as time goes by. Um, but so far, I haven't really assumed that, so I'm just, I don't need to assume that. So I'm use just any old constant uh, probability distribution. But let's assume, in fact, that let's, let's go ahead and assume that. Let's assume that Q is a dominant distribution. Then, in fact, it won't change with time, even if you evolve it in time according to the replicator equation. In other words, it's sort of as happy as it can be. And in that situation, well, then we always have that this relative information decreases or perhaps stays constant. So in other words, if there's a dominant distribution of your self-replicating entities, typically you should expect, I'm not, this isn't a theorem, but typically what happens is that P of T will evolve towards that. And definitely what will happen is that this information left to learn in going from P of T to the final Q keeps decreasing, or its derivative is less than or equal to zero. So that's a theorem about approach to equilibrium that applies in evolutionary game theory. But of course, a lot of more interesting things happen than just approaching equilibrium. People love equilibrium because you can understand it, not because it's really what the world is about. Uh, in fact, you could say that equilibrium is, uh, in biology, equilibrium is another name for death. Uh, right? so, so a, a biological organism that's in equilibrium is one that's been dead and sitting in a coffin for a thousand years or something like that. Then they're in equilibrium. Uh, but so any sort of uh, equilibrium state in biology you should think of as an approximate uh, situation where systems are approaching equilibrium in limited regions for limited times, like a climax forest may be a kind of equilibrium state for a while until something else happens. But so we'd like to go beyond this equilibrium uh, or approach to equilibrium issue, uh, but and we can. So even just using the plain old replicator equation that I've been talking about, we can already start seeing some more complicated situations while remaining, while, while keeping the discussion extremely general. Of course, you can go into detail and look at very specific examples and, and learn a lot, but let's see what you can learn that's very general. So probably a lot of you know about this much more than me, but I'll tell you anyway. Uh, there's a famous idea in evolutionary biology called the Red Queen Hypothesis named uh, after, well, probably from this very picture taken from, uh, is it through the looking glass? Yeah, I forget if it, yeah, through the looking glass. I forget which one it was. Uh, with Alice there and the Red Queen, and the Red Queen saying, now here you see it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. And the idea in evolutionary biology is that a lot of adaptation among organisms is due to competition with, with, uh, with competitors or with parasites and so on, where they need to keep on adapting just to stay as, as good as they are, just to stay as fit as they are, because their competitors are also changing their strategies. So replicators have to keep changing just to survive amid other changing replicators. And there's a, well, this is a, sort of baby example of, of how you can have a situation where instead of approaching equilibrium, things keep changing, which is a famous uh, example of a particular type of lizard. The common side blotch lizard has three different color forms, orange, blue, and yellow, these three chaps here. Uh, and it turns out that the orange ones, so, so the males compete for, for mates in this species. And the orange ones are extremely aggressive, and they're able to beat the, the blue ones 
in, in fights and get mates. So they tend to win if it's a one-on-one -on -one competition. Uh, the blue ones are, are fairly aggressive, and the, the yellow ones are complete wimps. So, so the blue ones beat the yellow ones, but although the yellow ones are wimps, they're not dumb. So what the yellow ones, what they do, is that while the orange ones are running around fighting people, fighting lizards, uh, the, 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 <laughs> the, the yellow ones sneak over to the mates and get the mates while the, while, the, while, while the orange one is busy fighting. So the yellow ones can beat the big, dumb uh, orange ones. And so this is a beautiful textbook situation because it's analogous in many ways to a famous uh, game, the rock, paper, scissors game, where you get three choices of, 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 of move, and where rock beats scissors, because as you all know, you can crush a scissors with a rock. Uh, you can cut paper with a scissors, and you can wrap a rock with paper. Uh, so you can make up a, a, a very simple example of a two-person game where each player has three strategies where it has this property that each strategy beats the, beats the next one. And uh, Cinervo and Lively wrote a nice uh, analysis of the lizard population uh, in terms of the rock, paper, scissors game using a replicator equation model uh, where the fitness was based on the idea that lizards are randomly running around meeting other lizards and, the, the, and they play this game essentially and the winner uh, has, ha, uh, has a higher fitness than, than the loser by some constant amount. So if you, if you pick the uh, if you pick the constants in these, in a sort of mathematically beautiful way, you get a replicator equation where the dynamics goes like this. So this triangle here is the set of all probability distributions on um, R, rock, paper, and scissors on these three uh, choices here. And so a point here would mean that they're all all our lizards are playing the strategy paper. This is all scissors. This right in the middle here would be one third of each kind of lizard. In the, in the most mathematically beautiful assignment of the constants to get your differential equation written down, you find that, that one third, one third, one third probabilities is a steady state, but that it's not an attractor, that, that in fact the probabilities, if they're somewhere else, don't approach it, it, they just go round and round. Um, now, I should say that's only with a certain choice of what the, the, the payoffs are for the game matrix. If you tweak them a little bit in one direction, th these orbits will turn into spirals where they spiral in, so then it will really be an attractive equilibrium. If you tweak them in some other way, then it will be a repulsive equilibrium, they'll sp actually spiral out. But that's not my main point here. My main point is here is that there are situations where instead of where you have the replicator equation and where instead of the population distribution approaching some dominant uh, distribution, which I've been calling Q before, it keeps moving around. And so this is just a simple example of where it do, does that. And in some sense, you could say, you'd like to say that there's some sense in which the population is always learning new information. So in other words, the, the, the probability distribution of lizards keeps changing. And so it keeps needing to improve itself to handle the situation it finds itself in. And it never settles down on any uh, final state. So the question is, how can you quantify this idea of the rate of learning, the idea that you continue to keep on learning in this situation? 
You're not, you're not learning in the sense of settling on the truth. You're not, the, the population distribution is not settling in on some uh, equilibrium necessarily. So you might not want to call it learning, but you keep changing your mind, you could say. So, so here's an interesting thing. There's a kind of puzzle or paradox, which is that if you have any probability distribution that's changing smoothly with time, you can look, you can try to figure out how much you're learning at that moment. So we pick a time t naught, and we see how the information of p of, what's the information of p of t relative to p of t naught. So this is sort of like how much you're learning as you go from your hypothesis at time t naught to some hypothesis at another time, and we differentiate it at t equals t naught to see how much we're learning right now. And the answer is zero. It's always zero. So, so it's hard to intuit this at first, but I, my joke explanation of it is the first order, you never feel like you're learning anything. I don't know even know if that's true, that people never feel like they're learning anything. But if you, feel, if you ever feel like you're never learning anything, well, this theorem explains why, I guess. <laughs> um, however, that's just the first derivative. Uh, if you look at the second derivative, as long as the velocity, the time derivative of p of t naught is non-zero, then the second derivative is always greater than zero. So, some, so in a similar jokey sense to second order, you're always learning something, unless, of course, you're not changing your opinions at all. So, so I guess that's good news. You're, you're bound to be learning something unless you just like have settled on your opinion. But, but of course, learning here is not meant to mean learning something true. It just means that you're, you're, you're updating your, your beliefs, and so this uh, quantity changes. So this, this takes a while to sink in, I guess. But, um, but marching on, this lets us define a kind of rate of learning or a speed of which, at which information is, is being gained when you have a probability distribution that's changing with time. And what you can do is you can just say the, define a length of the velocity vector in probability distribution space by saying that length squared, so this, these double bars mean the length of this vector, the length of this squared is equal to this second derivative. It turns out that, that that's a good notion of a, of a length of a vector in probability distribution space, or what mathematicians call Riemannian metric on the space of probability distributions. And it goes by the name the Fisher information metric. So I drew this triangle of probability distributions on a three element set, uh, which looked flat. But if you measure distances using this distance metric, it actually has the same geometry as a, an eighth of a round sphere. So it bulges it out that way. So it has a very, and that's true for, for higher dimensions too. So it makes the space of probability distributions look like a portion of a sphere. Um, I'd heard about Fisher information for years, and I never understood what the heck people were talking about. Uh, when I understood this stuff, I felt I finally understood what it was. Okay, it's just a way of measuring distances in probability space, or, or, or lengths of vectors in tangent to probability distribution space that comes from the idea of relative information. I don't know if you think that helps, but it helped me. So now, finally, suppose you've got some populations that are obeying the replicator equation, where these f of i's are any old functions of the populations. Then I've said that the probability distribution of, of your species will evolve according to this other equation. And then you can use that to work out what's the length of this velocity vector using the Fisher information metric. In other words, at what rate is information being gained uh, according to this Fisher information definition. And it's a beautifully simple formula, which says that it's equal to this quantity here. So here, we're looking at the fitness of the i species minus the mean fitness. We're squaring it, and then we're averaging that with respect to p of i. So this is just the variance of the fitness in the probability distribution pi. So the square of the rate of learning is equal to the variance of the fitness. So this is like 
this is similar to a famous and famously controversial theorem called Fisher's Fundamental Theorem of Natural Selection. I put, I put it in quotes because although there, he, there really is a theorem there, there's a lot of argument about what the theorem said and whether it really was a theorem. Uh, his, his theorem was more, had more uh, assumptions to it than what I'm stating here. It, it was a theorem saying that something was equal to something <laughs> and, the, and, the, and one of those somethings was this right-hand side and the other I don't want to talk about. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but his theorem is in some sense a special case of this one. So this one is true under whenever the replicator equation holds, whereas his was true under some subs extra assumptions as well. So I like, I like this one a little better. Um, so, so, what it's, so what it's saying is nice. It's, it's saying that the, the rate of learning is related to the variance of, of fitness so that, for example, if, if, right, if the variance is equal to zero, then there's not going to be any learning going on at all. So if you ever wondered why, does it, why is it good to have some people around who are so much better at things than other people, why aren't we just like all be the same? Well, if we were all the same, then presumably the variance of our fitness would be zero, and then we'd never, we, we, nothing, would ever, nothing would ever change. This would be zero. We wouldn't be learning anything as a population. So these are some basic facts about relative information, replicators, and, uh, and relationships between the replicator equation and information theory. So I like to think of these as like very basic ingredients towards some theory that a lot of people are working on from a lot of different angles, a lot more, many more complicated than what I'm doing, which would be trying to come up with some theory of biology as information dynamics. So I'm writing down some dynamics for probability distributions, which allows me to talk about uh, information and, and seeing how it's connected to concepts like fitness of replicators. So I'll quit here. And thanks for putting up with all the technical difficulties. Uh, yep. Uh, so from a statistical perspective, uh, can I think of fitness as log likelihood? I don't know how to, s I don't know how to answer that. Someone's shaking their head. Um, log, so, f I mean, I, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to say about that because I don't, that doesn't quite, I know what the words mean individually. Uh, but yeah, so fitness is just some measure of, that you get to decide, you have like a bunch of hypoth bunch of alternate things that may be true and we're assigning a, qual a quality or a measure of goodness to each one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, population size effects. That's the theory of just kind of like an infinite population. Right. Things. Yeah. Um, so Mark Harper has worked on some s generalizations or related results where you have finite size effects. I haven't I haven't looked into those myself. So I mainly recommend you talk to him ab about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes. I'm not that I'm not that practical. Uh, I, I might I might become that practical if I if now that you've mentioned it. Uh, but but I haven't I haven't thought of like trying to use this to 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 cure diseases. Uh, Mark Mark Harper and I have a have a friend Chris Hillman who's been like working on uh, on uh, the evolution of the AIDS virus where you, you do things like try to trap the try to give a sequence of, uh, of treatments which try to like trap the AIDS uh, genome into a situation from which it has trouble wriggling out into, into higher fitness uh, uh, 
configurations, whatever you call them, higher fitness genotypes. But I, I haven't I haven't really tried to think about how you'd use this for that. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you talked about this kind of with a finite number of uh, species or alleles. Have you thought yeah. about uh, ways to extend that to kind of infinite alleles or kind of mutations that can? Um, I haven't thought about it too much, but m well, so, uh, m almost all of this stuff will generalize to a case where the finite set is replaced by an infinite set or measure space. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that should be pretty easy. Pretty easy if you like that kind of math. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. So is it in the biological case the temperature uh, brought out, or are we literally talking about the temperature that's like brought up Earth, or is uh -huh. it an analogous temperature parameter that is brought out not be relevant, or does it actually refer to molecules? Yeah, so I was sort of, so I was sort of doing two separate talks here. So one with a replicator equation had no temperature parameter in it. Not your question still good, but I just want to point out, right, there's, the replicator equation had no temperature concept in it. The, the temperature showed up at the, at the, at the, in the first part of the talk, and if you wanted to, you could say that that, that shows up, uh, that's very relevant to situations where probability distributions are evolving via a Markov process. But but anyway, it's, it's still very good to think about things in terms to try to hybridize the two lines of thought and to think of temperature as, as relevant to general probability theory questions. And so, 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 so here we have this concept of energy, and the idea is that it low temperatures, the system is forced to be in the lowest energy state, and that at higher temperatures, uh, it's more likely to be at, at, at other energy states, and at, and at infinite temperature, it's equally likely to be in every state. So, so low temperature corresponds to a very spiked probability distribution which is optimized in some sense. Here it's in the sense of minimizing energy, but if you are studying some other question where you're trying to, where there's some qu kind of quantity you're trying to maximize or minimize, the, the low temperature regime would be where you've completely optimized whatever it is. The high temperature regime would be where you're very far from optimizing it. And that kind of I analogy is used in some kind of uh, learning techniques like simulated annealing where you where, where you have this metaphorical temperature and you raise this temperature, which means you randomize things and, and, and your system could be in any state. Then you cool it and it will try to optimize itself, but it may get stuck in some local optimum that's not the global optimum. So then you may like want to warm it up again and, and have it be able to hop to a better optimum or not. Uh, so I think of things in terms of temperature very often this way. And for example, like when I'm having math conversations with a certain friend of mine, we sometimes say like, okay, what temperature are we going to conduct this conversation at? If we have a very high temperature conversation where we like throw out all sorts of crazy wild ideas, the most of which are likely to be wrong, but allow us to explore the space of ideas. And then we can like cool it down and then sort of try to be more precise. And that like focuses us in on a specific idea but of course, we get get stuck in some idea that you know was not the best possible idea. So we mean like to heat it up a bit. So that's a very useful metaphor, and you can make it pretty darn rigorous using this math. Uh huh. Yep. Um, do you have an intuitive explanation for why the relative information decreases when the probability distribution starts to evolve via Markov form? Um. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, but can I turn that into a string of words? Um, so, so the simplest situation with a, with a Markov process is when there's is a, is a situation where there's one equilibrium distribution and every other distribution converges to that one. Then you can th then you can think. You can, you can sort of think of this relative information as like a distance. It's not a metric, but it's a quantity that's greater than or equal to zero and is only zero when two things are the same. So it has those features of, of distance. And so if you think about it that way, then you're saying that as things are evolving in time, no matter what two points you start at in your space of probability distributions, they're getting closer together. 
And that makes a lot of sense in the situation where there's a single equilibrium, because then everything's getting close to that. But this is a more powerful statement, because it's saying that any two probability distributions are getting closer to each other. So basically, you could say that a Markov process, things are sort of randomly jiggling around. And if you started out with two random, two, two probability distributions, so as they randomly jiggle around, they'll get closer to each other. The relative information is not really a metric, but, but that's one reason why this Fisher information metric is so nice. It's derived from, from the idea of relative information, but it actually is a strict distance function. In other words, it weighs the triangle on equalities and all that stuff. Uh, yeah? In your example of a rock, paper, scissors, you showed some limit cycles uh -huh. that go around, and you described that as continually learning. But wouldn't you come <laughs> back to the same state and yeah. know just as much as you had? Right. Well, that's why I was saying, that, yeah, yeah, that's right. So I, I'm using learning in a funny way there, which is, uh, so like, so, you know, sometimes I learn something, and then I learn that it's wrong, and then I learn that it's right, and then I learn that it's wrong. Uh, so, so, so learning is not meant to mean uh, approaching the truth. It really just means uh, gaining new, gaining information that you didn't have a gaining, minute ago. Gaining bits all, all around. Right. When you come back to where you were. Yeah. Right, yeah. So that's what it is. I mean, I don't think English is perfectly, I, w I understand that it sort of sounds stupid to call that learning, right? But you could, but it's sort of like, yeah, you know, I went on a really long walk. Where did you go? To my house. And where did you start? My house. Well, I, yeah, you could still do that, right? You go around a long trip. Yeah. yeah. For the limit cycles, is that if I just, if I keep going around in a circle and I choose two to be smarter or choose two to be dumb, I definitely change the percentage of frequency. In the one particular example I showed you, it turns out that it, that it was constant. I've been assured by people who did the calculation carefully. In this one specific example, which it, it, it happens that, that, that this relative information of these guys relative to, sorry, of this relative to these guys is, is constant. But, uh, but I don't think that that's a general feature. And so by tweaking the parameters of this game a bit, you can actually make these spiral away. And then it's actually increased. Then, then, the, then the relative information is, is not going down. It's increasing. So I imagine you could make periodic orbits that would be like you're going up and down and up and down. Um, well, if you want to really know, I just like grab this slide from a basic uh, MIT course on evolutionary game theory. And, and, and what they did was they were using the simplest, uh, simplest, um, simplest version where, where the payoffs in this rock, paper, scissors game were either one, minus one, or zero. So one if you win, minus one if you lose, zero if you're, just like if you both pick rock. And then and so uh, from, from with those particular choices of numbers, then if you have a probability distribution of people playing different strategies, you can work out the expected fit, your expected fitness if you're playing the ith strategy. And that will be this fitness function here. So remember, this depends on the probabilities populations of all the players. So with those, those specific numbers, you get that specific. Well, well, I don't, uh, on the one hand, these look really bland and default, and it gives you that. But on the other hand, when I gave this talk in front of an actual evolutionary game theorist, he said, this is absurd. The, the chance of this happening is basically zero, because if you, if you tweak these numbers, ever so slightly from these values, well, like make one a little bit bigger and a little, another a little bit smaller, then, then it switches from this situation into spiraling in or spiraling out. So this is not a generic uh, behavior for, for this kind of game. Limit cycles are usually like that. Yeah, 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 that's right, yeah. So it's a very delicately tuned situation, but it just happens to be the mathematically very pr simple looking situation. Yeah? Exactly, that's right. And especially if you think of it in terms of mating, right? You want to 
people will fall in love with you if you're if you're wearing shoes that are a different color from everyone else. Yeah, then it, yeah, that's right. Uh huh. Ah, very, 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 very observant. That gave me, that gave me grief for, for, for many months, and in some sense still does. Um, so here, this, this theorem, the equilibrium population, or the dominant distribution, is over here on the left, and we're getting a result like that over in the case of free differences in free energy, the equilibrium, which is sort of analogous to the dominant distribution, is the one over on the right. And that's just true. That's the way it is. Yeah. So it's 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 confusing and it's annoying, but it's just the way it is. Um, the in in the thermodynamic case, when you have a when you have probability distributions evolving according to the Markov process, maybe I shouldn't say thermodynamic, but in the Markov case, then this would be true for all Q of T and all P of T. So if one of them was the equilibrium, you could put it either one to be the equilibrium, and then this would be decreasing. So in fact, there you have both, both quantities where the equilibrium is on the left and where it's on the right are both interesting. Um, yes, I just, I mean, I could, talk to you about that personally, but I don't have like any really wonderful uh, short answer as to why that's true, but it's definitely true. So they're, they're, so it's, I guess it's, you should say that like in thermodynamics, you should say like my prior assumption is that something is in equilibrium and this quantity here is like how much information do I gain if I learn, hey, it's not in equilibrium, it's in this other probability distribution Q. That's like the main thing you should think about in thermodynamics. Whereas in the evolutionary game scenario, you should think of your prior as the population distribution now, whatever it may happen to be. And the main kind of relative information you're, we want to talk about is how much you would gain by, by going from that to the equilibrium. So yeah, you're right. It's the other way around. Yes? Uh huh. Uh, Hi. Uh, I like to think of it as noise in the signal because if you write uh, dQ equals, oh, sorry, dS equals dQ over T, uh, then what you're really doing is using temperature to dilute uh, the amount of uh, entropy. And so uh, now if you divide everything, divide both dQ uh, and dS and dQ by d little t, which is time, then you're saying that the uh, bit rate. Yeah, so the, you're saying that, so the rate at which you're changing entropy, sorry, the rate at which you're changing ent entropy is the power divided by the temperature. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. hi, by the way. <laughs> yes. Uh huh. Yeah. So when I'm being a mathematician, I said k equal t equals one. But if there's a physicist in the room, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's sort of related to your your question there. So so high selection rate sort of forces you towards optimization fast. So low, that's the, some analogous to low temperature where your, your water molecules will, will get down to the lowest energy state. Mm -hmm. Can I take one more question? Okay. 
Uh, did anyone not ask a question yet? Who wants to? Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. He, he goes for it. In the biological case, it's probably an interesting situation where new uh, communication or new strategies are being introduced. Yes. Which is just not, you know, doesn't satisfy right. what the goal of those is. So do things totally change? They do. Well, they definitely change. Yeah. I mean, so you, you uh, I haven't seen any. I was trying to give you like beautiful formulas here. So there, I don't think you get such beautiful formulas in that case. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's, there's something funny about that, which is just that, that this uh, replicator, I was trying to think about that. So this replicator equation, I mean, as long as you don't approach the boundary of the probability simplex, this is just like any old function of the probabilities. It's only the behavior of it as you go to zero. So, so that only as one of these probabilities goes to zero does this, you really like put a restriction on this quantity here. So, so although you, yeah, so this equation does not allow some completely new thing to emerge, but if there's like just one of them in a population of trillions, then it allows it to, to emerge. So in some sense, it's not very restrictive, but true novelty, where something that's never existed before comes into being, cannot be modeled by this no, equation. All oh, right, and also, yeah, the opposite. I'm, I'm an optimist, okay, but yeah, you can do the time reverse. Right? True extinction does not occur in, the, in this model. Yeah, just sort of like very low populations, but not complete depth. Yeah. Great. Okay, thanks. Thanks for all your interesting questions. That's great.